In November 2021, a 19-year-old Canadian student flew to the UK to finally meet a man that she'd been on an online relationship with for eight years. Should have been the trip of a lifetime. But Jack Seppel would not turn out to be the man of her dreams. He would prove to be her worst nightmare. This is what happens when a coercive, controlling relationship turns deadly. This is the murder of Ashley Wadsworth. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me. If you're new to this channel, I release my content on a Wednesday and a Sunday because crime and consistency is my catchphrase. Thanks for everybody returning here. You know I adore you. You know that without you, it would just be me at this moment, my cat, and an embarrassing lack of audience. So I appreciate you massively. As ever, big shout out to my YouTube community and my Patreon subscribers. Without you, this is not possible. Same to everyone though, you know I can't do this without your views, your likes, your comments. I appreciate all of you. Today's case is one that I heard about. It's a Canadian case, and I have decided that I'm gonna to try to do more cases from outside America and the UK, which is where I tend to concentrate my focus. But Everybody deserves a legacy, and this case really resonated with me because I think that the internet is an amazing thing. It's an amazing tool. For example, I don't have to walk anywhere near as far as I did when I was a kid because, you know, you can just dial someone up on Zoom or get in contact with them on social media. There are some awesome opportunities it's created, but there's also a danger about the internet. You just have to think about love con experiences and murders on the internet, essentially, through social experience and dating. These are all things that are very much modern phenomena. And today's case is gonna explore a very connected case to this new emerging technology. So let's go back to early 2022. We've got a 19 year old Canadian, Ashley Wadsworth, living in the UK. So she had basically traveled to the UK on a six month tourist visa. She was on a gap year and she'd arrived shortly before Christmas in 2021. So from the age of 11 or 12, she'd actually been in this on off relationship. It's an online relationship, not a physical relationship with a guy who was four years her senior. Now, obviously, if you were actually in a physical relationship with somebody four years your senior and you were seeing them at 12 years of age, that would be an issue. Absolutely, but this is online, so the dangers aren't as clear in that moment. Now, his name was Jack Seppel, and also he's English. So you're talking about literally living in different continents, and therefore the anxiety that will be provoked if your child was speaking to a 15, 16 year old when they're 11 or 12, it's going to be diminished because at the end of the day, how on earth would they ever get to know or see each other? So they had made contact with each other when he was 15. And I guess the closest I would align it to is that they were modern day pen pals. So they would communicate via Facebook and they were 4,500 miles apart. And because of this technology and the fact that now you can literally FaceTime somebody, Zoom somebody, WhatsApp somebody on video, it makes it a lot more real, doesn't it? So they would often be messaging each other and FaceTiming each other. And actually he would even send a presence, which believe me, if I was 12 years of age and a man from across the world, a young man from across the world, was sending me presents, I would feel like the luckiest girl in the world. That's how you would feel. Because who doesn't want to be noticed as a young person? Some guy paying attention to you, calling you, no threat because you don't actually have to physically see them and he's treating you to presents. That would make them seem so authentic, so caring, so kind. Obviously, this is the other side where a few of us are going a little bit on the groomy side. But again, the age gap is not so catastrophically large that it's going to draw attention in that way. But we could argue that it does feel a little bit disingenuous of a boy who's four years old, which is a considerable age gap at this point, to be sending presents because he would know how that would tie 
in to her having a big idea about their relationship. Remember, at 15, 16, you know relationships in a very different context to how you do at 11 or 12. But she falls for him completely. You know, she buys in to what he's creating. So let's, before we go on and talk about how this plays out, let's look at Ashley. Because she was lovely. She really was. So she's born on the 25th of July, 2002. She was a native of Canada. And her mum, Christy Gendron, and her father, Ken Wadsworth, they'd actually split up when she was very young. I've seen interviews with these individuals and what can I say aside from the fact that they are just lovely, doting parents. In spite of the fact that they split up their main priority for the children and it's one of those families that you just look into and it oozes love and it oozes foundation and support and they were, are and will no doubt always be devoted to this girl and of course now the memory of her. Now Ashley had grown up with a single mother so because of the split this had occurred but I come from a single parent family that's what I am and was for a very long time very proud of my years as a single mum and as long as your children are your focus they get the best of everything it's as simple as that. So she'd grown up with this single mother father very actively involved in their lives and she has an older sister Haley, again lovely woman who doted on her sister. They all grew up in Vernon which is a small town in British Columbia and again it's a close-knit small community so if you're an individual with big dreams about the world, even though this kind of a place will literally give you the benefits of so many opportunities, safety, the practicalities of knowing people and being able to rely on them, a supportive framework to grow up in, a free world to grow up in because it's a beautiful area. If you've got these big dreams about the world, it's not likely going to be enough for you forever, at least for a period of time, at least until you probably want to settle down and have children yourself. So it's gorgeous, but I can understand why a young person would grow up thinking, I want a little bit more than this at this point in my life. Now, Ashley's family describe her as being a kind and beautiful woman. They say that she had an unforgettable laugh. And her mum actually described her as the backbone of the family, which is really upsetting when you think about the context that we're talking about today. Because when you think about the backbone of the family, you think about something that holds it together. And then when that's eradicated, you wonder about the impact and the ripple effect that's going to occur within the dynamics of that relationship and family structure. She was said to be fiercely loyal, very outgoing, and she was referred to as someone who had an old soul who lived fast. I love the description of that. So an old soul always brings you into this idea of somebody with a wider knowledge and a wiser knowledge than they should have for that age. And somebody who lived fast is a kind of person who always makes choices to be present in the moment. And that's hard. And somebody who can embody the wisdom and the presence all in the same moment. I think that's quite a unique personality. From the age of 14, she was somebody who worked hard. So she worked hard in her education, but she also fitted jobs around her education. She was known to always go to bed early. She also always woke up early, and that's because she had this passion for living. She was known to be over generous. She spent money on others regularly. And one of the things that was very present throughout her childhood and adolescence was she had big plans for the future, really big plans. The world was going to be her oyster and she was going to achieve her dreams. She was outstanding actually as a student. She was fabulous at sport. She was incredibly gifted at skiing. And if I cannot express any further how amazing she is holistically, I can additionalize this incredible individual by noting that she also spoke three languages. She hoped to pursue a career in law. But you can just tell from what I've talked about, she is really outstanding for her age. I mean, incredible. I can very rarely master one language. The idea of mastering three is not something that I believe will ever happen in this universe or any other universes. I can ask for 
a cup of tea and a croissant in French though. So at the end of the day, I'll always have food and drink should I find myself living in Paris. But she is an individual who embodies life and living and she also embodied a pro-social attitude to the world around her. So psychologically, she's well adjusted. She has a really good emotional connection with her family and she's got a real thirst for her future. So she'd actually been at this point accepted at Thompson Rivers, which is a university in Kamloops, which is in British Columbia. So she's got things coming to fruition and she'd also recently just joined the Mormon church. She just turned 18 and that was when she'd connected in that way. So her faith was really important to her. And clearly, again, we're just adding this very well-adjusted, well-rounded mindset to this very young girl. Now, she was obviously talking to Seppel online with this, I suppose, long-term type of relationship. He had, of course, being a young man who's older, he'd been seeing other girls during this time. So it's not as if he was being faithful to their relationship. It's not as though she was the only person on his radar. And that worries me because Ashley is the kind of individual who is committed and determined. So if she is going to commit to an individual, she's going to be loyal to them. And the idea that you can be chatting to this guy who's professing to care for you, sending you lots of presents, saying how much he wants to see you and equally going out with other women, that means that there is a disloyalty about him and a lack of commitment. I also understand that Ashley psychologically would consider herself not in a position to demand loyalty and commitment because she's four and a half thousand miles away. But it's a red flag for me. And we get to eight years after they've been communicating. So she's grown from being a child into a young woman, a young adult. And Ashley at this point wants to go to the UK. She wants to meet Seppel in person. And I think most of us would have an absolute sympathy and empathy for that position. You want to see the world. You've got this opportunity to meet somebody that you think you're in love with. And they're in a country that you'd love to explore. What's not to like about that deal? So this is her plan. So she takes a year out of education and she flies halfway around the world to be with him. Part of that was to do with the mentality of, escaping the small town life, even though there were so many beautiful things about it. At this moment in time for her, it wasn't big enough. She wanted to travel. She loved traveling, in fact. She enjoyed learning about other cultures, religions, languages. The fact that she could speak three languages demonstrates that she was somebody who would grasp travel in a different way to the way that many of us would. Because for her, she would be genuinely learning. It's clearly something that she's gifted at. So it would just marry the own gifts that she holds already. So this would be the perfect marriage as far as her languages and love of travel are concerned. You know, they would inspire her further. So she had traveled before she went away to the UK extensively within Canada. She'd also been to Mexico, she'd been to California. And her mum actually described her as a modern day hippie. She really loved people. She really loved life. She apparently lived life to the fullest. In fact, everybody who knew her said that about her. People said that she lived life every day like it was her last. That's an enviable position to be in. I think that most of us strive to be more present, strive to be more mindful about our day-to-day -day experience, try to be grateful for all the good things. But being actually able to translate that into your actions, I think it's formidable and I think it's inspirational and she was managing to do that. You won't be surprised to discover that her mother and father were not too keen on the idea of her going to England. They really struggle with the idea of being such a long way away and I appreciate that massively when you're a parent. You just want to know that if your child needs you, you will be available to them instantly. And you know that if they get on a plane and travel halfway across the world, you're not going to be able to do that. You can't just immediately protect them and keep them safe. There are all those questions that you have about their security. They didn't feel very secure knowing that she was going to go and stay with somebody that they didn't really know. But what could they do? At the end of the day, she's an adult. 
she can do what she likes. You can put your boundaries in, you can say no, you're not allowed to, but when you're a young adult, you're going to ignore them. It doesn't mean you don't respect their position as parents. You're going to ignore them because you have a life to live and a life to lead. Now, a granddad, on the other hand, he actually was really positive about it. He encouraged her travel plans. He thought that the UK was one of the safest countries in the world. And I think that he would be right in that position. It's also full of incredible architecture. We're also in the uncannily lucky position to be in such a small country that you can travel from pretty much one end to the other very easily. So as a tourist, you actually can do a hell of a lot in England in a very short space of time. And like most places in the world, every area is slightly different culturally. So if you're in the south of England or the north of England, you're going to be experiencing different dialogues, different eating habits, different experiences. And because everything is so close together, everything is very able to be visited. So it would be a trip of a lifetime for her. And she was incredibly excited. And obviously her granddad was just on side with that, which I think is lovely because you need somebody in your family being the confident one saying it's all going to work out, even if things don't work out. Now, her dad, on the day that she flew, he dropped her at the airport. And it's really sad the moment that you conceptualise that. This is a man who adores her. This is a man who really would rather that she stayed at home. This is a man who's brought her up, doted on her. He's a massive part of her life. She's a massive part of his. And he takes her to the airport and... He drops her off there and he has no idea that's the last time he's ever going to physically be within her presence. It's the last time he'd physically see her alive. It's unimaginable. It's every parent's worst nightmare that a tragedy could befall their child so grotesque, so malevolent, so terrifying that not only would it rob you of physically seeing them again, it would rob you of your peace. These are things that live within our darkest nightmares and for them to play out in actuality it's too horrible to even imagine now although ashley and seppel had been having this online relationship basically for years going on a decade she was not aware of who he really was this guy and i'm gonna say it he's horrible I'm sure that members of his family will believe there are some redeeming qualities. I can't see them, genuinely. This guy has a really violent past and he is a young person still. And that is deeply disturbing. He had eight previous convictions for 12 offences and nearly all of those were for domestic violence. And two of his previous partners, they'd actually had to take out restraining orders against him. Now, this is a young man. This is sustained and consistent behaviour and it's dramatically distinct from what we expect for a young man of his age. And the fact that two of the girls had actually felt so worried about their safety, they'd got these restraining orders against him, it's provoking a real sinister vibe around this particular individual. So it shows this clear pattern of violence, clear pattern of controlling behaviour, and this dates all the way back to 2014. And to put this in context as well, and just give you a bit more gravity to this, his own mother, 55-year-old Tracy Dalton, she'd also been granted a restraining order by Essex Magistrates Court because he'd assaulted her. He'd damaged a car, he'd damaged three external double-glazed windows, he'd damaged internal doors as well. That was in 2018. And at the time that he carried out that horrific violence towards his own mother, he was actually on a suspended sentence for harassing one of his previous partners. So at this point, that means he's in breach of the suspended sentence because of the crimes that he had against his mother. And therefore that led to him being actually sent to a young offenders institute and he served eight weeks. He was also banned from going near his mother's home until 2019, the July of that year. There was also a threat of a five year imprisonment if he was breaching that particular order. So this is really disturbing. His impulse control is non-existent. His pattern is evidential. He is a danger to women. 
You know, we're not hearing about him getting into altercations with men. We're hearing about him bullying and abusing women. So he has a particular type of victim, ones who will not be as powerful as him. It's as simple as that. So Ashley has no idea that she is walking in to a wolf's den. Seriously, that's the only way this can be described. This is a young girl. She is somebody who's got so many great attributes, but she's not massively worldly wise. She certainly feels that she's got these loving intentions towards him. She's going to pursue her dreams and she is walking into a nightmare. Ashley arrived in the UK on the 12th of November, 2021 and basically moved into Seppel's one bedroom flat on Tennyson Road, Chelmsford in Essex. Now, again, one could say, well, that's quite rash. They've never met each other, but they've been in this relationship online for such a long time. I imagine she absolutely feels like she knows him and he's never given her any license to believe that he's a danger. So when you travel to another country, if you've got a free place to stay, that is going to be a major bargain. And it's going to be massive in impressing on you the fact that going away and traveling is possible. So she gets there, moves into this one bedroom flat. Again, that's not ideal because we could instantly say, well, there might be some issues around stress and frustration because there's not any room and cabin fever can set in. But initially they upload pictures to Facebook, shows the couple going and looking at lots of tourist attractions in UK. Essex isn't too far away from London. So it's a great place to go exploring because London is insanely busy and it's only somewhere I can go usually for work and spend a short amount of time in, but it is profoundly beautiful as well. It's just, as a Northern girl, I need space <laughs> and you don't get it. People just walk into you on the street. They all have headphones in. Some of them seem to be looking at their phones whilst listening to headphones, whilst walking in a direction that their gaze doesn't even seem to be going in. And it can be quite difficult. It's like being in an arcade game where you've got to avoid things and I'm the avoider because they don't want to avoid anything. They're quite happy to bang into you. But it's gorgeous, beautiful place and perfect for going on tourist visits. So that's what you're seeing these trips to London, tourist attractions in the UK, they look really happy together. And she's saying to her family, look, he's really kind. And that is all you're gonna want to hear as a parent. You know, is he nice? Her sister's really close to her, she's checking in with her. And yeah, all of this is being relayed, that it's a great connection. So the family believe that everything is going well. But we all know that looks can be really deceiving because Jack's actually unemployed. And if I'm honest, the couple, they just tended to stay in the flat all day. He hasn't got the money. He can't take her out places. I think he's very controlling from the get go. And so the consequence of that is that she's being a pleaser and she's doing what she needs to do to make him happy, as opposed to thinking about her needs and how she requires to make herself happy. And the other thing is that she probably feels like she has to toe the line with him because she's staying on his turf. And that means that she has less power in the experience of the relationship because he could ask her to leave at any moment in time and she won't want that. Now, it doesn't take long for Ashley. She's a bright cookie. Remember this. This is a very intelligent, articulate young woman. She realizes very, very quickly that Seppel is not the guy that she thought he was going to be. He's not this ideal partner. First of all, he has serious issues with his mental health. So over the Christmas period, he ends up taking an overdose and it's Ashley that calls the ambulance and gets him rushed to hospital. But I will tell you now, you all know my feelings on mental health. You know my own losses regarding mental health. I know that mental health does not make you a horrible, coercive abuser. That doesn't make you that at all. Antisocial personality disorder will make you that. Narcissistic personality disorder will make that. That's not a mental health condition. When we're talking about mental health decline, we have every empathy and sympathy. People get themselves into awful states or react to situations that provide them with the feelings of not wanting to carry on, for example. And we totally understand that when those things happen, people need support and care and sympathy and empathy and everything that goes with them. But what I am telling you now is that's not why Seppel was doing doing it. Seppel was not in this terrible distress where he needed all this support. It's a way for him to start manipulating his girlfriend. I mean that. 
This is a way of him starting to control the world that Ashley lives in. So following his discharge from hospital, immediately friends of the couple, they start noticing that he's been really coercive, he's been really controlling, and that means he's reverting to type. There is a rule in therapy where when we're working with a client and they get into a relationship, we check out the kind of connection that they have because often they'll be projecting into that relationship an expectation of what they deserve and it's really important that they realise that they deserve better if it's not a positive experience. And my rule is always to say to people, anyone can behave for two years. Some people will say less, but for me, it's like anyone can behave for two years. If somebody isn't nice to you for the full two years, if you're arguing constantly after a few months, you need to remove yourself from the relationship because anyone should be able to behave for at least two years. Ideally, behavior remains in a stable relationship for the rest of your relationship and you never get into situations where you are abused in any way, shape or form. But certainly, if somebody is being nasty to you early on, that is a terrible sign and you should vacate the situation and people start to see that this pattern is evolving again. So, he takes control of her social media accounts because he doesn't want her to be able to contact her friends. If anybody ever does that to any of you, get your stuff, leave your phone with them if you need to, and remove yourself from that situation. No one has the right to do that to you. It is coercive control. It is not somebody just being a little bit suspicious and paranoid and wanting to check things out. It is an individual beginning the incremental change in the relationship between the two of you so that you have no freedom and that they control you on every single level. It is very powerful taking over somebody's social connections and it says something deeply malevolent about the nature of that human being. He also deleted her posts. He changed her passwords, and it wasn't long before he turned aggressive. And wow, some of the voice notes that Ashley recorded are truly disturbing. Oh, my temper coming back. This fucking thing on my fucking lip. I'm gonna fucking. It's fucking me. My fucking lip. It's fucking driving me crazy. I'm so fucking ill. She actually sent them to her friends because clearly she was probably looking for advice and guidance regarding them. They're awful. I mean, the guy sounds absolutely unhinged, but not in a I'm in mental decline. It's a projective unhinged. It's a I am going to make this about you not being supportive. I'm going to make this about somebody needing to tend to my needs. There's very little responsibility and accountability in them. It's very much about him and the poor me experience of being him. So you hear him screaming in this rage. He even threatens to kill her. And you can imagine for this young girl who was hoping to find the very best in the world and she's suddenly confronted with this guy that she thought she knew really well and seeing the very worst of him, it's blind signing for her. How do you match up and equate the person that you spent so many years communicating with, with this monster? And I mean monster. Her family at this point, they start to notice a change, the way that she speaks on calls home. She's actually scared of Seppel overhearing the conversations. And on one occasion, she actually says that he'd hit her over the head with a glass. Again, this is where, when you're older, you realize on the whole, not for everyone, but on the whole, the transition of time is helpful because you get to go through so many different experiences. You have these different relationships. You have comparison bases and you're like, this is a terrible relationship. You know, if you've been in a few relationships and then you end up with some monster like Seppel, you're going to know straight away, this is a terrible relationship. I don't deserve this. If you are young, you've built a picture of possibility with this human being who isn't fitting that paradigm, but that you have this whole history with and you want him to be the person that you believed he was, you are going to try to forgive these misdemeanors because you don't want to firstly feel like you were a fool, secondly, feel like you're letting them down, and finally, feel that the person you'd built up in your head is a myth. You want to believe that just something terrible is happening in that moment and it can be overcome. But now he's got her social media, 
then he's stopping her from having real authentic conversations with her family and he's now got physically aggressive you know this is a girl in serious danger she has no comparisons to make with other relationships so potentially she isn't even ballparking this as a dangerous situation because she's thinking well maybe this is how relationships are sometimes in intimate relationships her mum understandably because she's a mum and a daughter she raises concerns but Ashley claims everything's okay and this happens all the time in domestically abusive situations because admitting it to yourself is terrifying so instead if you deny it to other people then maybe you can deny to yourself that this is really happening later down the line an actual video would be found on Ashley's phone and She'd made videos of the horrible injuries that Seppel had inflicted on her and they were awful. I mean, the bruising on her legs and arms is really extensive and I can't even begin to conceive of how her family would feel finding those kind of images and thinking, my God, my daughter, my sister, my friend, she was in real danger and she had a suspicion of that. So she was taking these pictures because she clearly knew that it wasn't okay, but the confidence that she needed to just express that clearly hadn't got to the point where she felt she could. And she's probably still trying to defend him in her head and protect him. And yet the last thing this man needs is protection. He needs prevention, needs incarceration. But we're talking about Ashley, who's a lovely young woman seeing the best in the world. Even when her family end up begging her, and I mean begging her to return home, she said no, she said she wanted to stay, she wanted to work things out. That to me shows two things. One, he's already got a really high level of control over her. But secondly, she has been there when he has tried to take his own life, although it was totally manipulative and it was emotionally based on controlling her. She won't feel that way. She will be thinking, my God, if I am leaving him, there is a strong likelihood he could do this to himself again. So that is emotionally blackmailing to a point of abuse beyond belief. She's having to deal with these all in the same moment, whilst thousands of miles away from her own family. And I imagine with every breath of being, she wanted to go home, but it's hard to make that decision. So we get to Tuesday, the 1st of February, 2022. Now this morning in particular, one of Seppel's neighbors hears a woman scream and then shortly after this she sees Ashley who's at her door and Ashley is absolutely hysterical which you would be because she ends up telling her neighbor that Seppler basically thrown the pet kitten Winston against the wall I swear to you if Seppel had done that to one of my kittens Seppel would have found what it was like to be embedded in said wall but again, what do we know about the McDonald triad? What do we know about early childhood problematic behavior? Animal torture, animal harm plays into it. So the fact that he's willing to take a very vulnerable kitten and throw it against the wall demonstrates great malevolence within his nature. And I'm sure it's been there throughout his childhood. I'm sure he is an animal harmer per se. Then after doing this heinous act, which is absolutely blindsidingly traumatic for somebody like Ashley who's the kindest person in the world to know that she's watched her kitten be flung at the wall that is going to be traumatic beyond belief anyway he then beats her up and he smashes her phone now this is explosive this is terrifying and this is certainly very dangerous malevolent behavior and again Ashley ideally at this moment in time would realize that she is worth a great deal more and that this man is very threatening and has potential to do great harm. The problem is what we see in relationships is that often we will look at somebody and imagine that they could only do a level of harm that we conceive is possible within a relationship. We don't think, wow, the way they've just treated me could mean they'll kill me. In our heads, we go, well, I could never kill anyone. And yeah, they're more violent than me, but no, they could never kill anyone and that's why people end up dead. It's not because they're stupid, it's not because they're foolish, it's not because they're just unable to make the break, it's because they believe better. And that's the downfall, they believe in better. These women who stay, these men who stay in these situations and lose their lives, they are not idiots. They just sadly have a bias 
that that person hasn't the capacity and capability to do the very worst. And unfortunately, that misconception leads them to their death. Now, at this point, Ashley is on the button. She really is. She actually tells her neighbor that she's scared he's gonna kill her. And she says that the reason that he's been so provoked into this anger, there's never a reason to be provoked into this anger, by the way. But again, this is what coercive controllers and violent abusers do. They convince you as the victim that it must be something that you've done. You're the reason for their problematic behavior. And basically it was because he had seen her looking at a picture of a naked woman on her phone. I swear to you. He projects all of that blame. He projects a license to catapult a defenseless animal at a wall and to beat his girlfriend up because she is looking at a picture of a naked woman on her phone, which she has every right to. If she wants to pin up every page three that's ever been in her room, she can do that. If she wants to go on Pornhub and every other site that she may choose to, knock yourself out, kid, there's nothing wrong with it if that's what you're into. If you're not into it, that's fine too. I'm saying whatever makes you tick. The point is no one has a right to control your behavior based on what you want to do as long as it's legitimate and legal. End of. But of course, he has no idea why she's looking at this naked woman. I mean, a lot of us look at women because we're quite envious of their figures, for example. But for him, he decides it's because she's a lesbian and he flies into a rage. So this is his reasoning. You're looking at a picture of a naked woman and therefore you clearly want to leave me in an adulterous way because you want to be with a female. I mean, with respect to this moment in time, it would be good sense to do that, don't get me wrong, because he is a horrific, heinous excuse for a human being. Now the neighbor, who is lovely, and I've seen the neighbor interviewed as well, and she genuinely cared deeply about what happened to Ashley. And she's traumatized by what's played out, just to put that in as a caveat. She actually says, look, we need to call the police. And Ashley does what pretty much every woman does when that first option comes up to call the police. She says no. She resists because she doesn't want to get him in trouble. And that's the irony. These horrible perpetrators who couldn't care less about your feelings who really don't care about how they injure you, you end up protecting them because you know that what they've done is so heinous it will result in charges. So it's the very fact that she knows what he has done is so serious enough to constitute that reality that makes her deny going ahead and doing it, even though it's the very thing that she absolutely 100% should have done in that moment. And her neighbor knows that, but again, for her neighbor, really awkward situation, you know how it is, people don't want to offend, even though we know we should. And so for her neighbor, because she's got this relationship with Ashley and Ashley's saying, no, I don't want you to do that, it puts her in a very difficult position and she kind of accepts and respects what Ashley wants. The neighbor then goes and speaks to Seppel. And at this point, apparently he's calmed down a little bit. He then apologizes to Ashley because he's a massive manipulated piece of S. And he knows exactly what he's doing at this moment in time. And just bear that in mind, because if we're going to pretend for one minute that somebody is in mental decline, they ain't manipulative. They're not able to calm themselves down and assure a neighbor that everything's going to be all right. He's not going to harm her. And that's what he's doing to Ashley as well. I'm not going to harm you. Just come home. You have to know what's going on. You have to know how to manipulate someone. You have to be aware of what you intend to gain from doing that if you are in a mentally stable position that's why you do it no one who is mentally unstable is going around calmly reassuring people that everything's going to be okay you are either in mental decline or in a position of something like psychosis where you're having a break from reality or you are totally aware of what's happening to the point where you can literally manipulate your environment and circumstances to suit your needs Ashley, of course, because she is a rational, well-adjusted human being who has also been coercively controlled for a period of time now, so her confidence about her decision-making will be under scrutiny as far as she is concerned. She listens to him and thinks, well, a reasonable human being wouldn't be able to be calm and suggest it's all going to be okay unless they were calm and it was all going to be okay. She applies her own logic psychologically to a man who is absolutely antisocial beyond belief. 
So she mismatches her own perspective and perception and experience of how she would be cajoling somebody to return and applies it to him. And that's really the mistake that kills her. It really is. So she ultimately goes back to the flat with him. Now the neighbor, she had a hospital appointment to go to. So she ends up going and knocking on the door before leaving because she wants to check that everything's okay. I mean, God love that neighbor. God love that neighbor that there was something within her that made her feel unconfident about what was playing out and responsible as well. She's obviously started to feel that because she's been involved in the altercation and she's felt very protective over Ashley that somehow she has to be responsible. And I love that kind of characteristic within human beings because you can make such a difference to the world. She doesn't get to in this case, but that's not for want of trying. So she doesn't get an answer. And so in the end, she shouts through the letterbox. And at this point, she gets a response. So Seppel replies that they're in bed. So the neighbor at this point leaves the couple. It's 9.30 a.m. at that time. You can understand that no matter the misgivings that the neighbor had, she probably doesn't want to interfere. And as far as she's concerned, okay, he's saying everything's okay. He's meant to be calmer now and she did want to go back and it allays the concerns to a point where she's accepted that. What I would say is even though Ashley's gone back, it's clear that she was not at all feeling safe with Sepal. In fact, she'd gone ahead and she'd spoken to her mum and to her sister on the neighbour's phone and they just basically said, look, no, no more. Absolutely no more. Enough is enough. And She'd actually said, it is. And she said she wanted to go home immediately. She wanted to go back to Canada immediately. And this is how desperate her amazing family were. Her grandma got straight ahead in booking a flight for the 3rd of February, 2022. I mean, she would have returned sooner, but remember, we all had to go through the ridiculous pantomime of getting COVID tests. So nothing was as simple and Sadly, it was never a return journey that she would ever be able to make. But you can just feel, can't you, the desperation of her family, that grandma is literally looking up and booking a flight immediately. They just want to get her back to their shores. And that must have been building for such a time. And you can imagine, can't you, that feeling within you of, oh my God, thank God, thank God. God, she's coming home. Thank God we're going to be able to see our baby. We're going to be able to look after our loved one. She's not going to be in danger anymore. You can just imagine them thinking about all the things that they're going to do to remind her of how loved she is after such an awful time. And the fact that they never got to offer that support again because of this bastard, it's incomprehensible to manage those feelings. I truly believe that how they cope is something that definitely deserves praise and admiration because I don't know how I would. And I'm sure that many of you feel the same way when you think about losing a child or a loved one. Now, of course we have Seppel, who is already fired up, angry, rageful because he can't manage his own emotions because of his pathetic emotional immaturity and also because of his antisocial mindset. So he ain't, okay at all about Ashley taking any control back. Now bear in mind when it comes down to coercive control and abusive relationships, one of the most dangerous moments for any partner who's trying to extricate themselves from the relationship is when the other partner, the abusive partner, realizes they are losing control. So when Seppel learns that Ashley's basically cutting her trip short and she's gonna go home, not only is he enraged because he's gonna lose her, He's enraged because, hey, that isn't what controlling people ever feel is acceptable. As far as they are concerned, screw the abandonment issues, screw the letdown of the relationship not working out. No, we're talking about how dare you as my partner think that you have a right to make choices that are autonomous over your body. I own you. 
you're mine, it's my territory. And we see this time and time again, the absolute danger point is when a partner finally finds the strength and resolve to remove themselves. We see when a partner has managed to extricate themselves and then they are murdered because they've been stalked and they've been found and that abusive partner has gone ahead and killed them. It's a sense of, if you are leaving me, that's fine, but don't expect that anybody else will be able to have you. And if I find you, you're not going to even get to live the life that you deserve because I'm going to take it from you. It happens time and time and time again. I've covered so many cases on this channel which explore that reality. The fact that this abusive, consistently abusive, in fact, when we see seen throughout his relationship, man feels that her desire to return to the people who bore her, who love her, who support her, is a reason to be rageful, is even more testimony to the kind of fractured character this excuse for a human is. He now knows, and that means that she is in such danger. Now, it's around noon later that day that two friends of Ashley's, who were in Chelmsford, which isn't far from where they are, they're from a Mormon church. So she's been attending this Mormon church, as I've described earlier on, she's discovered the church and got involved in it after 18, and faith is really important to her. They actually receive a message from her and they're really concerned. So bear in mind, she's actually unable to use her own social media accounts, but she had managed to send a message from Seppel's Facebook account. And it actually says that she needed help and that it was an emergency. She gave them her address and she even asked them to come over and get her. But there's another couple of hours pass and then they receive another message from her. And that says that everything's sorted and that all she needs to do now is to go and get a COVID test. Now, it transpires, of course, that those later messages haven't actually been sent by Ashley at all. They've been sent by Seppel. And the whole premise of that was because he didn't have any intention of wanting anyone to come and help her. Also, we have a sister who is frantic, absolutely frantic. She is trying to contact her sister on Seppel's phone constantly, absolutely getting no joy there. She knows absolutely without a shadow of a doubt that something is seriously wrong. Now the friends, they're also really concerned for Ashley's welfare. So they decide in good faith that they need to check on what's happened. So they go around to the property later that afternoon, don't get an answer, keep knocking on the door, bearing in mind, you know, they've heard from Ashley and it's not adding up. One hand, she's asking for desperate help. Next, she's acting like everything's okay. Now they get there, why isn't she answering the door if everything's okay? Even though they are knocking and getting no response, they can hear somebody is physically moving around from inside. So now they're really alarmed and they're really worried about her safety. So they end up calling the police. This is at 4.01 p.m. And the officers arrive just minutes later. And I have to say, you know, listen, I criticize the police when they deserve it. I really do. And there are lots of cases I've covered where the police deserve it. They've acted abhorrently. They've made massive letdowns. They've falsely convicted people on lies. These are all things that happen. But on the whole, when you just see ordinary bobbies doing their job and going out there and trying to protect the public, it's pretty inspiring when you see them act in the way that they acted in this case. Really, I watched what happened and I watched how this played out. And it really shows you the level of care that these particular officers had in this situation. Because when they don't get an answer from the property, they aren't leaving that. There's absolutely no way whatsoever. And they let them know, because as far as they're concerned, there's two of them in the flat. And they're basically saying, look, if you don't answer the door, we're coming in. And, you know, the bar for doing that can be relatively high because you have to evidence why it was appropriate to knock somebody's door down but they just pursue it and they're saying you know if you don't answer this door I'm gonna get in and ultimately they do force entry to the flat you know the guy kicks the door in at 4 13 p.m because they are really deeply concerned about the fact this could be a domestically violent situation they want to protect Ashley it's really sad because those officers would have, without a doubt, done that. They would have absolutely 100% protected that girl. 
they went there with the full intention and force to do so, but they're too late. And when they actually enter the bedroom, it's horrific, absolutely horrific. And for those officers who clearly have a desperate desire to be the best type of officers there are, to walk into a scene where first of all, they know they failed in protecting, it's not their fault, but they failed in protecting, it's too late but then to be traumatized by the scene that they've seen. Seppel, at that moment in time, was literally in the process of FaceTiming his sister. Now, I want you to put this into context. The police have just broken into the house, desperately trying to find Ashley, obviously concerned about her safety, and they're walking into a real gruesome scene, and this guy is FaceTiming his sister alongside Ashley's lifeless body. And actually during the call to his sister, he had shown Ashley's body to her. So I can't imagine how his sister would feel because it must be ultimately so challenging to hold that level of juxtaposition to the feelings. You know, you have a brother, you love him, you've seen him in his best times as much as his worst times, and you're literally watching as his future disintegrates before you and how his actions confirm your fears about him. And then you're being traumatized by seeing this poor, innocent girl's body next to him. That must be a moment in time that is frozen in her conscience forever. And she becomes a victim in that moment without a doubt. The police see straight away that she's been stabbed countless times in a chest. She'd also been strangled, but obviously the immediate look of the crime scene is that she's been stabbed and her body was still in the bloodstained bed that they shared. And he actually says to the police at this moment in time, I went psychotic, I'm sorry, I strangled her and stabbed her. And I don't buy into that for a second. I don't need anybody to assess him. I don't need a psychiatrist to come and tell me fundamentally where his chinks and his armor are regarding the psychology of him. I don't need two individuals in the defense and prosecution arguing as experts against whether he was insane or sane. It's BS. And the reason for that is somebody who is in a psychotic episode who has lost it, and I know this, I have lived this, it is personal for me, it really, really frustrates me when these individuals are wheeling the old, I didn't know what I was doing, I was insane for the moment, when only hours earlier they were able to manipulate a situation to coercively bring back a partner by promising her everything would be okay, and to cajole a neighbour into believing exactly the same story so that he could lure her back so she could be murdered. That is not somebody who is out of their mind. That is somebody who is very much in control. A little bit like a serial killer mindset. An individual who can get you to comply so they can actually get away with doing what they wanna do. You know my rule guys, do not comply. Always imagine the worst. It's not gonna do you any harm to do that. Yeah, might make you a bit more of a pessimist in the long term, but it also means that you'll be alive. That's not victim blaming. Ashley deserved life. My God, that girl deserved life. And you know what? In that moment, he should be the one not breathing. It's as simple as that. Everyone's done the same thing before we go any further. This is an unwitnessed arrest. She's got multiple significant stab wounds. She's got a rigor mortis jaw. I think she's beyond the help. I don't think we should go any further. That's the one that's paying the deceased. The police, obviously, they've called the emergency responders. They want to try to find out whether there's any way they can help Ashley, whether they can bring her back to life, essentially resuscitate her, but sadly she's really unresponsive. And in fact, it's been such a passage of time since her being actually killed that rigor mortis was setting in and there was literally nothing that they could do. And she ends up being pronounced dead at the scene at 4.38 p.m. And it's horrific because she's out on the grass outside the home when this is all taking place and the neighbours are obviously absolutely devastated. And bear in mind that poor neighbour who so wanted to help her and now she's realising that this horrific murder has played out and she'll feel like it was on her watch. When they do the autopsy, understandably, we know that she's been stabbed, we know that she's been strangled. They find out that Seppel had inflicted at least 90 wounds on Ashley with a knife. Just imagine that, 90 wounds. 
There were also defense wounds to Ashley's wrist. So clearly she was trying to fight back in a moment. But when they look at the majority of the injuries, they were to a chest area. So he wanted to kill her. You don't stab somebody in their chest because you're playing. You stab them in their chest because you want to execute them. It's as simple as that. And when they looked at the injuries, they were just massive. She'd had injuries to her heart, her lungs, her liver, her stomach, all her vital organs. And they also found bruises around her neck, which was consistent with strangulation. And they found marks on her face, on her neck. They found marks on her arms, her legs. You know, all these bruises were evident of a really sustained attack, as well as historic attacks. What is probably the most shocking is that after Seppo had executed this poor young girl in the most torturous and brutal of ways, he just went along about his daily business as if nothing had happened. So aside from FaceTime and his sister, it was also established that he'd actually uploaded a Facebook photograph on his profile picture on Facebook. And it was an image of him and Ashley together. They were both smiling in this picture. Obviously, it was a better times. And under that, he put the phrase, mine forever. So chilling. And it's so chilling because we all know that that's not delusional. That's not psychosis. That's a message to the world. No one else is having her. She's mine forever. And again, it brings me back into the serial killer mindset. I think about Samuel Little, a man who said that when he murdered people, he possessed them. In fact, Green River Killer, exactly the same. So many serial killers. Israel Keys is another great example. They believe that their victims would be reunited with them when they died. I mean, they were wrong. The only moment that their victims may be reunited with them when they die is so that big G.O.D. can say, here we are, here we are victims, this is your perpetrator. Now, which array of tools would you like them to be eternally burnt with in various annals of their body? You can all select one. We have a long time to see this play out. At that point, I'm all for the fact that they'll meet the victims again. And I think that my fantasy is more of a reality than theirs. But that's what he's doing. It's possession. Jeffrey Dahmer talked about that. The ownership of his victims. And it's about dominion. And it's letting the world know. I did this. I took her life. And no one else is having her. It makes my blood boil so, so intensely I can't describe it and we see this again and again with perpetrators this sense of no one has a right to something that I believe I own because every victim is simply an object for them to do what they wish to do with the forensics come in obviously it's really integral and important for them to find forensic evidence and they search the flat it takes them a while but in the end they do find the bloodstained knife it's actually been hidden behind a radiator in the lounge and they very quickly established that it's a perfect DNA match for Ashley and also they find that Seppel's DNA is on the handle so bang to rights without a shadow of a doubt this guy is going nowhere no matter what he says he is 100% guilty at this point Seppel is arrested he's charged with Ashley's murder and then the police obviously have to interview him and there are actually three subsequent police interviews and during these, it's awful because he just remains completely emotionless and he answered no comment to questions, which you all know how I feel on that. If somebody says no comment to all the questions when they're already bound to rights, I say, throw them in prison forever. Give them no trial. There's no hope for them. That's what I would do. But again, apparently... I don't get to do that because, I don't know, I didn't qualify as a barrister and a QC and a judge, but whatever, splitting hairs, I still think the consequences of actions that I'm talking about make more sense than a lot of our legal system does. Anyway, ultimately, he says, no, I'm not going to answer any questions, but he does ultimately plead guilty to the killing on the 7th of September 2022. 
And this is after he's interviewed by a psychiatrist because obviously one of the things that they have to make a decision on is whether this person is sane enough to actually enter a plea. Like, do they know what they are doing? And a psychiatrist says he is absolutely sane. They do establish that his mental health issues were there, that he had some, but they said there is absolutely no way on earth that it diminishes the responsibility for the killing. Now, when Seppel went to court, he simply told the judge, I'm guilty. And I'd like to imagine that was conscience. I'd like to imagine that was remorse, but I think it's just at the end of the day, there was overwhelming evidence. It was substantial and there was no way he was going anywhere. So he may as well just admit that he's guilty because it means it is going to get a lesser sentence. Let's just bring it back to the cool, cold facts of this situation. He ain't thinking about Ashley and her family. He's thinking about how do I get a reduction on my years? And that's the key. You say, game's up, gov. I did it. And like I said, there was no way he'd have ever got away with it. Prosecution would have ripped him to pieces, simple as. Ashley's death did have a massive impact, it really did. They had an impact on the people locally, so there were vigils that were held in parks around where she was staying. They had flowers, balloons, candles all placed out in those areas, all about her memory. They launched fundraisers. They wanted to raise money to help the family with the funeral costs. They wanted to help the family repatriate her body because, of course, that's expensive. She needed to be taken back to Canada. It is unbelievable to people in the UK that Ashley arrived here because she wanted to see the beauty of our country. And then she was literally murdered by a UK citizen, by an individual that she should have been able to trust. And to add insult to injury, that happens that her grieving family are just expected to pay thousands of pounds to have her body returned home. It's an absolutely shameful state of affairs. The government should have 100% made provision for a woman from another country murdered by one of our own to have that body repatriated. But then when do the government really care about people? I mean, that's so, I don't know, 1900s, isn't it? Government actually caring about the people. Actually, that's a lie. The government never really cared about people. I'm just looking back to the fact that my great granddad was in the workhouse as an illegitimate child. No one cared for him. Never mind. So we've got this scenario now where the family have got this undue pressure and they're dealing with the grief. And it's horrendous. It really is. And of course, during this process, investigators are trying to look further and further and further into how this horrible situation played out. So the investigators finally are able to look at Seppel's mobile phone and what they find is really disturbing. So they realise that he killed her several hours before the police arrived and he'd actually filmed himself on his mobile phone around 12.45pm on the day of the murder. And in that video, this guy is covered in blood and Ashley's totally lifeless body is just in the background. It's visible. And when he made that video, that video was actually addressed to Haley's sister and is basically apologising for what he'd done. I mean, thank God there was actually no evidence that he'd sent it to Ashley's sister, but can you imagine how that would have impacted on her? I mean, I don't know how you could hold that knowledge in your brain and the distance you had between you and your sister and your inability to be able to protect her in that moment, how to keep that in your head without going crazy. I really mean that. Thank God she never received that. I mean, this is too difficult anyway for a family to deal with, let alone having those additional burdens to manage. Now, like a lot of prisoners, whilst he's on remand in prison, he actually has time, I guess, to think about what he's done, how he's acted. So he actually goes ahead during that period of time and writes to Ashley's family and he apologises for his actions in it. And a part of it read, I know that no matter what I wrote, there is nothing that I can say that can bring Ashley back, nor can I make your pain go away. I'm so very sorry for what I did. And I regret my actions that led to taking Ashley's life. You have known of my mental health as I was open to Ashley about this and how it affected my thinking. And whilst other people may not believe that my mental health has deteriorated rapidly and it's no excuse, I want you to know that my intrusive thoughts have a big effect on my thinking and my actions. And I just wanted to tell you, I am so, so sorry. 
I cannot buy into that BS. Sorry, I can't. I'm sure he feels incredibly sorry for himself and he recognizes that his actions were extreme. I'm not denying that. I am saying the idea that he is blaming intrusive thoughts, which for those of you who don't know are on the OCD spectrum, also people with psychosis, schizophrenia can get intrusive thoughts. They are very debilitating. They tell you horrible things about yourself. They make you believe that you're capable of a whole array of horrific things, but you're not. That's why they're intrusive. They're intrusive because actually you don't want to do any of the things they're telling you and you feel like a terrible person because you're having these thoughts. In fact, you are the absolute opposite to those intrusive thoughts. You are a good person, a sensitive person, a loving person, a kind person. That's why it is so painful to have to manage these horrendous thoughts in your head. The difference is intrusive thoughts don't make you go and kill somebody. An innocent, lovely, kind, caring, compassionate young girl. Absolutely under no circumstances. And they also don't make you coercively control someone, manipulate someone, be violently abusive to someone, coerce them to come back to your home when you intend to murder them. That's not what intrusive thoughts do. That's what psychopathic people do. That's what murderers do. That's what Seppel did. Because he's all of the latter that I've just described, except the intrusive thoughts. Ashley's family are having to deal with this as well on the other side of the world. Can you imagine that? They kiss goodbye to their child and she's never coming home, not physically to them, aside from in a coffin. And they also have to manage the fact that there is this hearing and they actually end up flying from Canada to attend the sentencing hearing, which must have just been the most traumatic experience. The sentencing hearing actually happens physically on the 10th of October 2022 and that's at Chelmsford Crown Court. Now, prior to the actual sentencing going ahead, the family had an opportunity to read out their victim impact statements, and they did. Her mother stated this, Ashley's passion and love for Jack would ultimately cost her a life. She always wanted to help him and better him and help him when he was in hospital and he repaid her by taking her own life. It's had a profound impact on my life. I only sleep an hour or two at a time as I think about her last minutes. I walk into her bedroom every day and I only go in when I am strong enough. It was supposed to be me first, not her. Jack has robbed Ashley and all of us of what would have been a beautiful life. She was so far away and I couldn't see her and it took us three weeks to get her home to Canada. Ashley has been ripped away from us in the cruelest way. I think we can all relate, even though we've not been through it, to those imagined feelings of ourselves going through something so heinous, but to actually live that out as a mother. And again, that distance and space from her child, a child that she would have wrapped her arms around and moved heaven and hell to bring her home safely, it is so challenging to imagine that they've had to go through that. And something that was really poignant for me, and when I read about this, and learn about what her mother had done. It was like, again, just another telling knowledge of the love within the family. Because when they had the funeral in Canada, Ashley was buried 12 feet down. And the reason for that is that her mother plans to be buried on top of her, six feet down. It's a way of her letting Ashley know that they'll always be connected and she couldn't be there in those last moments for Ashley, but she'll be with her eternally when her time comes. Now, bear in mind, Ashley also has an older sister, Haley, who's incredible. And she was due to get married. And Ashley was going to be her maid of honour, which is just another thing stolen. This is what happens when people murder other individuals. You're stealing so many memories from people who deserve those memories. You're stealing a human being of infinite meaning and you're removing them from every event that will ever be in that family's history. You're erasing them from a place they deserve in that legacy. When she was in court, she said that Ashley was her best friend. She said, Jack took Ashley from us. She was strong, loving and fiercely loyal, spiritual, beautiful, and completely innocent. We trusted you to look after her when she came to England. You broke that trust. 
It's had a ripple effect on the family. I hope the time you spend locked up will make you realise what you have done and that you don't get to do this to anyone else. Very measured, believe me, very measured. I'd probably have to be removed physically from the court and I don't know whether the amount of swear words would ever be allowed to go on public record. But again, this family have real dignity, real dignity. Ashley's father, Ken, stated this. Jack, you need to know and accept the brutality of what you've done and the never ending pain you've caused our family. It's because of your choices. I hope you sit and think long and hard about what you've done. Ashley is forever loved and missed. We recently booked a flight and the lady who was dealing with us didn't know us. But when she saw our names, she started crying. I am forever grateful that I got to tell Ashley that I loved her the last time I spoke to her. Isn't that just so devastating? And also just those moments where a human being who doesn't know you but knows of your story is so moved to show the emotion. I doubt that woman booking the flights truly understood the impact that she'd have, but her compassion in that moment, it must have spoke volumes. When it came to sentencing, 23-year-old Seppel was sentenced to life in prison by Judge Mr Justice Edward Murray and he was given a minimum of 23 years and six months. So he'll have to serve that before there's any chance of him even going for parole. When the sentence was passed, I'll be honest, Seppel showed absolutely no reaction. And that was in context of how he was as well when he was being interviewed. So it's not as if he showed any expression. And I think that that's, again, very disturbing for a family member because you're saying you're sorry, you're saying you show your remorse, you're saying you wish you hadn't done it, but at a moment where essentially your freedom has been taken away, you don't even show an emotional reaction. It's just out of context with the reality of what's happening. When the judge spoke about him, he referred to him as a dangerous individual and he actually described the attack as brutal and cowardly, which it definitely was, but... I don't just think it was brutal and cowardly, it was torturous, sustained and executionary in style. Now, since Ashley's murder, Essex Police have actually opened a domestic homicide review and it's going to actually review and examine the case of Jack Seppel. So it's going to take a look at that. Now, in the year ending March 2022, around 7% of women and 3% of men experience domestic abuse, which is a pretty staggering, staggering statistic. 103 people were killed by an intimate partner in 2021, 2022. So within that year, 103 people. Ashley was of course, victim of domestic violence and the authorities were not aware of it, but she was very vulnerable, wasn't she? She was alone essentially in a country, far away from home, she's basically on her own, she just wanted to love life, live life, see the world. We're talking about a young woman who was an absolutely adored daughter and sister and a devoted daughter and sister, granddaughter, auntie, all of these things she embodied. And we can never forget that because that's where her meaning lies and it will lie there forever. He might have stolen her future, but he hasn't stolen her meaning. And I'm always very conscious and aware that we must focus on the life lived, not the death experienced, or to some degree it loses its meaning. Now, whilst it was established that Seppel had problems with his mental health, bear in mind, there was no way it met the bar for an insanity defense. He knew what he was doing when he killed her. He knew it was wrong. His actions were not caused by mental illness. They were a result of a violent, controlling, dangerous and abusive personality. He was prepared to go to any lengths at all to get what he wanted. Now, one of the things that the police have actually revised is how they now deal with issues where domestic violence occurs, as well as actually how they identify perpetrators regarding things like coercive control before they actually get to the point where tragedy strikes. And following the enactment of Claire's law, this is in 2014, this is a law for those of you in the UK who might not know about it. It means that any member of the public has a right to ask the police if their partner may pose a risk to them. It's also known as the domestic violence disclosure scheme. So this 
particular scheme will reveal if any previous history of violence has happened where a partner is concerned. And just for reference, that's named after Claire Wood. So she was a 36 year old woman from Yorkshire and she was sadly murdered by her ex-boyfriend who was a guy called George Appleton. That was in 2009. So they connected on Facebook and she had absolutely no idea about his violent past. So after Claire had ended their horribly coercive relationship, he continuously stalked her, he threatened her and ultimately strangled her and then set her body on fire which is why these kind of relationships are so dangerous when somebody's trying to leave, because often this is a point where they really are under threat of their life. So her dad, who was amazing, absolutely incredible, he really campaigned for a change in the law and he ensured that that happened, which is incredible. So Claire died, but so many men and women will be saved because of her father's actions after her death. Now, Ashley's mother, she's somebody who said, you know, since seeing this happen with her daughter, it's really important, the message that she wants to give to people is that if somebody is coercively controlling you, you need help, you deserve help. Don't suffer in silence, don't think you're doing anything wrong, don't have shame, speak out. And if you're not sure whether it is coercive control, speak to people about it, because they'll be able to help you figure out whether it is. Because that's the thing about coercive control, it's so manipulating, it's so cajoling, it's so convincing, that in the end you think, am I reasoning with unreasonable? Or actually, am I the one who's getting this wrong? It's a really challenging thing to extricate yourself from and to identify at times. And what Ashley's mother said is, it's too late to save Ashley, but it's not too late to save yourself or someone you love. And I think those words are really powerful. It's too late to save Ashley, but it's not too late to save yourself or someone you love. And if you're listening to this today, you've come across my channel and you might not know who I am, but you're in a situation where you're questioning the legitimacy of your loving relationship because you think that potentially you are being controlled or you are being abused. If you're having that feeling, that's an instinct and an intuition you need to act on. Do not wait. Speak to a friend, speak to a relative, call a helpline number, go and see a police officer, do something, take action because your life is priceless beyond meaning and if you are having those suspicions, those suspicions will be there for a very good reason. Do not suffer in silence, do not suffer alone. This case is one of those that highlights that even when we believe that we truly know someone, it is actually only when we meet them and spend large amounts of time with them that we really start to see their true colours and no matter what your history, bias, belief system has been up until that moment, you have to take the individual as they are in that moment. If someone is controlling, if someone is aggressive, if someone is abusive, that's who they are. Don't forgive them because you have seen them previously in a different light. Understand they were simply very effective at hiding their darkness. I'd love to know your thoughts on this case. And for those of you who've watched this and have been in abusive situations, just be aware that we fully understand that it's not because you were foolish that you stayed, it's because it's very complicated and difficult to extricate yourself from such tangled webs, particularly those that are filled with deceit, lies and coercion of a partner who wants only the worst for you, but disguises it as wanting what's best for you. Let me know your thoughts. If you've been interested in this, I'd love to know your comments and personal experiences, but most of all, I want you to remember what I said earlier on. These kind of coercive controllers need us to comply. Do not comply. Never comply. You're worth it. You deserve a happy, healthy future. Take care, guys. Be safe. <laughs>